Hi again, I'm John Deary and we are talking on our face-to-face -face series with uh, attorney and by the way also MD, uh, Elliot Wolf from the law firm of Wolf and Furman and we're delighted that he works of counsel with our firm on handling a number of very important medical malpractice cases. So he's very, very qualified to be responding and we'll continue our conversation as two attorneys and hopefully you'll learn and find uh, the conversation to be uh, entertaining and uh, informative, most importantly. Elliot, let's pick up on a subject of statute of limitations as it relates to medical malpractice cases. Very, very important and actually different from the more traditional three years as we have in other kind of personal injury matters. Um, there's a, an exception carved out in the law for um, medical, podiatric, and dental cases. Um, not chiropractic, by the way. Just medical, podiatric, and dental cases, which is a two and a half year statute of limitations against a uh, non-municipal defendant, somebody who doesn't, who's not a city or state employee. Um, so for st um, any other negligence action, which it would be three years, uh, the time frame in which it had to be brought, um, there's a half a year less in medical malpractice actions. There are some exceptions, and I think they're important to note for our viewers. Yes, there are. Well, the first exception is uh, a municipal defendant, a city defendant. So if anybody um, is um, subjected to malpractice by uh, a physician uh, uh, who works for the city or um, by uh, um, a city hospital, then there are two different and much more limited time frames that could control those lawsuits. The first one is called um, the notice of claim, and that's under Article 50. Um, any claim to be brought against the city has to be noticed, they ha the city has to be told about it within 90 days of the last date of continuous treatment. Um, there are rare exceptions, but the general rule is within 90 days of the last day of treatment for that same condition, if the treatment is continuous, a notice of claim has to be filed. And then the lawsuit has to be initiated after a, a hearing which the city notices the attorney about or the um, claimant, then um, within one year and 90 days of the last date of continuous treatment. And um, there uh, is a lot of law on this because it's, the city has effectively limited many, many people who might have had the most meritorious of lawsuits because they weren't noticed on time or brought on time. Um, because a lot of times what will happen is a person will wait more than the 90 days and then think, oh, let me just go back to the city hospital. If there's a 90-day break, then the, there is no longer continuous care and treatment. And even though they went, somebody went back for that care and, or, and treatment, it's not continuous, and that might knock them out of the box, so to speak. How does that differentiate on the notice of claim in the 90 days and the, the uh, year and 90-day and, uh, uh, formula? How does it differ if, for example, it's a private hospital? Private hospital is only subject to a two-and-a-half-year statute of limitations. There's no notice of claim. Um, the, uh, somebody can be out of the hospital for two years, five months, and 29 days, and then bring a claim, and that claim is timely. Mm -hmm. Bringing that same claim against a city hospital, that claim would be thrown out of court. Since we're talking about it, and it is so significant, I'm going to read in the five boroughs, not all, but the major city hospitals in each of them, just so that you're aware of this important distinction that Elliot is making. In Manhattan, it's Bellevue, Harlem, and Metropolitan Hospital. Those are the three dominant hospitals that the city operates. In the Bronx, Jacoby, Lincoln, and North Central Bronx. In Brooklyn, Coney Island Hospital, uh, Kings County Hospital, and Woodhull Medical Center. Those are those three. And in Queens, there are two, Elmhurst, and Queens Hospital are the two city hospitals. And in Staten Island, it's Seaview Hospital. Those are the ones, those are not the exhaustive list, but those are the, the primary list 
uh, of the hospitals that are operated by the city. So that word about the statute of limitations is important and the notice of claim. What happens if the, the uh, injured party is an infant? What does that do to the statute? The, um, the law is, is um, much more generous with an infant. And uh, infancy or being under the age of 18 tolls or puts off the statute of limitations. Um, in the case of the city, uh, it's, um, or the case of any, any defendant, really, it's ten, at this point it's 10 years. So an infant who has, gets injured at, at age one, a lawsuit can be brought for them up until their age 11. Um, again, when suing the city with an infant, a motion would have to be made to file a late notice of medical malpractice, uh, a late notice of claim. And that late notice of claim motion would have to be heard and, and uh, ruled upon. And if it's ruled upon favorably, then the, uh, a notice of claim could, will be considered filed and then the case can be brought. The city, um, to bring a late notice of claim, you need to have some proof of the injury in the city records, mm -hmm. in the medical records. So if somebody says it was a birth injury and they want to bring the case when the child is 10 years old, if the city record, the hospital record, doesn't indicate anything untoward in the delivery, um, I've had cases where the judges said that, you know, the notice of claim is, is good, but the appellate division said, no, it's not, because the city was not put on notice mm -hmm. through their own medical records. If they're not put on notice through their own medical records, even though the statute allows for it, you still not might be able, you still might be precluded from going ahead with a lawsuit. Suppose an individual, a patient goes to Hospital X, has a surgical procedure performed by Dr. Y. Who is the action brought against? Is it brought against the hospital where the surgical procedure uh, was done, or is it brought against the individual doctor who performed it? Well, the simple answer is it depends. Okay. If the patient is the patient of Dr. Y's and goes to Dr. Y at that hospital primarily to get Dr. Y's care, then the hospital is not liable for Dr. Y's actions. And in that case, if Dr. Y does something horrible and causes a terrible problem, the patient will be limited by Dr. Y's coverage, by how much insurance Dr. Y has. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if um, a person goes into an emergency room with an emergent condition, not knowing a doctor, saying, treat me, I have a problem, and the hospital designates Dr. Y, then Dr. Y is working in, as the agent or as the employee or as the designee of the hospital, and the hospital is liable for Dr. Y's actions. So in that case, you would, uh, both Dr. Y and the hospital would be viable or proper defendants in a case like that. What happens if you have a situation where there's a medical malpractice case uh, that goes on for a period of time, and in the meanwhile, the patient passes away? What happens to that lawsuit and what impact does that have on the family? Okay. The, uh, first, if a patient dies during the pendency or during uh, the time that a lawsuit is being brought, um, the first question is, did the patient die because of the malpractice? If they died because of the malpractice, then a, um, a new complaint, an amended complaint has to be served because you're going to bring a cause of action, you're going to make a claim that the death, the wrongful death, was caused by the malpractice. And it, um, if that's done, then an estate has to be set up, a legal representative, kind of a point person acting on behalf of the person who passed, has to be established through the surrogate's court. Once that person's established, the amended complaint could be brought, and then some discovery has to be repeated because that person will now be questioned as the representative of the estate. Um, if the person passes from unrelated causes, you would still br um, have to amend the complaint because that person can no longer be a party to the action because they're no longer alive. So that would delay the case in, in that you'd still have to amend the caption, but you would not have to amend the, the complaint itself. And so therefore it would be a much simpler process. 
One final question has to do with a, an individual who is affected by a malpractice or believes they have been, but they are out of status. They are not uh, on an immigration basis uh, concerned about their uh, condition. What happens there? Can someone bring an action if they're out of status? Um, persons who are uh, not, can't show that they're legally in this country do have rights. They can bring a lawsuit. In fact, the appellate division has held that they can even um, um, make a claim for lost, loss of earnings um, because if they were earning money before here, so that it's, it, um, it's reasonable to assume that they would have continued to work and make the money they made before, um, and that can be extrapolated by a, a, um, an economic expert, mm -hmm. and that, that can be proven, and that is something that is recoverable. Um, they have rights to bring a lawsuit, um, absolute rights. A lot of people who um, are not legally in the country are afraid to get involved with the judicial system because they're afraid of uh, deportation or uh, being identified as someone to be deported. Mm -hmm. um, in two decades plus of doing this, I've represented many people who have um, um, not been in the country legally and never as a result of the case that they have brought has their immigration status been questioned to the point that they've um, had to deal with immigration. Elliot, appreciate your thoughts on our face-to-face, -face, and thank you very much. Pleasure, John, as Thank always. you. Well, again, thanks very much for watching. I hope you found it informative. And just a reminder, we have our question and answer brochures on the medical malpractice area. And many of the questions and answers in that format were things that we discussed with Elliot uh, today. So if you wish to have one, it's our pleasure to send it along either by email or mail. Just uh, email us at info, I-N-F-O, at johndeary.com, and we'll be delighted to get it out to you. But thanks again for taking the time uh, to view our series face-to-face.